Blockbuster, the epitome of 90s nostalgia. Once hated because of its late fees it slapped on us, is now a beloved memory for the nostalgia it conjures up. While many people believe Netflix was the sole reason Blockbuster was run out of business, there were a slew of other decisions by corporate heads that led to the company's death. Not embracing the internet, trying to open an amusement park, and then not giving up on that idea, pure luck on the side of Netflix, bad customer service for a period, spending goo gobs of money on advertising, expanding into markets it didn't have experience in, hosting awards shows, and expanding at the cyclic rate all had a helping hand in Blockbuster's eventual demise. In this video, I've got exclusive interviews and statements with former international Blockbuster managers, the current manager of the last Blockbuster store in the world, and exclusive statements from Dish Network on the current status of Blockbuster. That's right, Blockbuster still exists today in more than just one store. This is the rise and fall, and rise again, of Blockbuster. Hi, I'm Isaac, and this is Movie University. Here is the obligatory plea for you to subscribe to my channel since you're already here. But seriously, please subscribe, share, like this video, and comment below, because all those things do help small channels like mine grow. If you've ever watched other YouTube videos on this topic, or talked among your friends, they all undoubtedly all told you that Netflix killed Blockbuster. Reed Hastings founded Netflix, a DVD-by-mail rental service at the time, in part after being frustrated with a $40 late fee from Blockbuster. While Netflix certainly played a hand in killing Blockbuster, the red-colored streaming service we know of today was only the final nail in the coffin of a long list of mistakes made by corporate-level Blockbuster leaders. The perfect video store Welcome to Blockbuster Video is popping up all over the country. At Blockbuster's peak in 2004, it had over 9,000 stores, with half of them in the United States. So how did Blockbuster get its start and end up the way it has? To answer that question, we gotta go all the way back to the late 70s. It all started back in 1978 when David Cook and his wife wanted to get into the video rental business. After failing to make a splash at selling software to oil companies, Cook bought into a small video rental franchise store called Video Works in Dallas, Texas. Wanting his store to stand out from the crowd of competition in the area, Cook asked for permission to decorate his store with a yellow and blue color scheme. Management at Video Works denied his request. Angered, Cook opened his own store and called it Blockbuster Video in July 1985. The first Blockbuster opened with 8,000 VHS and 2,000 Betamax tapes. Cook's earlier experiences in the software database industry came in handy, such as already having the knowledge on how to track inventory using barcodes. While not the first company to use the technology, Cook perfected it for video rental. His knowledge of software and database cataloging allowed him to organize titles better than his competition. Another thing that made Blockbuster a success was that it was the first video rental store to keep inventory on the shelves. Contrary to what grandma and grandpa will tell you about how things used to be in the good old days, people in the 80s had sticky fingers and would walk out with movies from the store. Video stores would keep the movie case on display on the shelves and you would bring the display box to the front counter and the attendant would hand you a copy of the movie. Another version of this back in the day was a token system where a token would be placed on the shelf indicating if the movie was in stock in the back. Blockbuster system, however, let customers know what movies the store had in stock versus hoping the attendant had the copy you wanted in the back room. However, with 10,000 tapes in the first Blockbuster store, it was impossible to have everything in the back room, so Cook decided to keep inventory on the shelves to allow people to see what was in stock while saving space. Upon initial success of the first Blockbuster, Cook opened three more Blockbusters within a year and began franchising the company. He also spent $6 million to build a warehouse in Garland, Texas to allow fast distribution of movies to his stores. 
The warehouse also served as a logistical hub for future blockbuster stores. It also allowed the ability to dispense or hold movies that weren't needed at locations as Cook had devised a system that allowed the tailoring of movies based on demographics and tastes of local communities. With Blockbuster a hit, the franchise began to expand in not only locations, but also in content. In 1987, the company began to rent out video games from its locations. A court battle with Nintendo spewed into public view and into the halls of Congress about Blockbuster's ability to rent out games. In the end though, Blockbuster won and began renting out games for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Nintendo would later adopt the idea of, if you can't beat them, join them. We'll talk more about Blockbuster game rentals in a bit though. In that same year, Waste Management co-founder Wayne Huizinga acquired several Blockbuster stores. One of Heisinga's colleagues at Waste Management, John Melk, was intrigued by Blockbuster's business model, logistical efficiency, and family-friendly oriented approach. You see, at the time, there wasn't a store solely dedicated to just movie rentals. Stores back in the day started out selling electronics or developing film or some other business and then eased into video rentals, but not Blockbuster. And Blockbuster had a catchy phrase too, the wow, what a difference phrase was a deliberate jab at other rental chains and mom and pop shops. Wow, what a difference! Pick up Die Hard today. Heisinga and Melk embarked on an aggressive expansion program. When they got into the blockbuster business, the company only had 19 locations. Under their rapid expansion, Blockbuster blew up to 400 locations by the end of 1988. This is partly due to Huizinga and Milk buying out smaller video rental chains. The expansion was so rapid that for a period of time, there was a new Blockbuster opening every 24 hours on average by 1990. The family-friendly oriented tactics were particularly useful to Blockbuster's expansion plans. Another thing that made Blockbuster feel premium from the competition at the time was that it had in-house magazines for its customers. These magazines gave recommendations and had exclusive interviews sometimes. In the early 1990s, Blockbuster began to diversify its portfolio and expand it even more. This is typical of business strategy. They all want to keep up with technology and consumer taste. According to Blockbuster's annual financial report in 1993, the company acquired Movieland, Movies at Home, and Videotown, they also created a division within the company called Blockbuster Music and bought music companies Sound Warehouse and Music Plus to eliminate some of the competition. As I stated already, Blockbuster had gone international. In the 90s, it went across the pond to the UK where it purchased Ritz Video Chain. All 875 Ritz Video stores were rebranded to Blockbuster, making it the number one video rental store overnight. The top grossing film of the year is now on video cassette. Terminator 2, Judgment Day. Part of Blockbuster's success was the adoption of video cassette recorders around the world. But you might know these as VCRs. Cook started the company at just the right time in 1985. In 1982, three years before the first Blockbuster opened, only 6% of US households and 10% of UK households had a VCR. By 1986, a year after the first Blockbuster opened its doors, 33% of US and 40% of UK households had VCRs. The VCR and video rental markets were exploding. People were choosing to rent movies over buying them because of the cost of owning a movie. Instead of paying hefty prices to own a movie or hope and pray your favorite film might air on TV, people were choosing to rent movies and Blockbuster was right there to sweep in the profits. The 1993 Blockbuster annual report outlined how the growth of VCR adoption played into the company's business. VCR unit sales in the United States have remained relatively constant during the past five years, averaging approximately 12 million units per year, while VCR market penetration in the United States has grown significantly, increasing from 53.3% in 1987 to 80.5% in 1993. VCR penetration continues to increase in many areas of the world in which the company currently has operations, including Europe, the Pacific Rim, and Central and South America. 
By the end of 1994, VCR penetration is expected to increase to approximately 77% in Australia, 74% in the United Kingdom, 75% in Canada, and 72% in Japan. By 1994, Blockbuster was a multi-billion dollar company and the undisputed king of the video rental world. But it didn't want to get left in the dust and realized it needed to diversify its portfolio some more. Huizinga dabbled with and was intrigued by video on-demand services that were beginning to gain traction as internet technology improved. He also briefly considered purchasing a cable company. However, since cable TV business was unfamiliar territory for Blockbuster, he decided against it. The irony of this we'll get to in a bit. As technology improved, many industry analysts began stating that the days of physical entertainment would be a thing of the past. Alarms were going off inside Blockbuster. Blockbuster's business model also relied on late fees more than it should have. To remain profitable, Blockbuster needed to expand even more. In 1994, Blockbuster inked a deal with Sega and created Game Factory, a line of rewritable game cartridges. By using rewritable cartridges, Sega and Blockbuster could save money and always have hot new game titles on the shelves for consumers versus having to keep buying games. Game Factory was tested out at 10 Blockbusters in Columbia, South Carolina in the fall of 94. However, by the spring of 95, Game Factory was killed off due to lack of interest from gaming studios. Studios didn't like the idea of not selling original copies of games because they'd lose out on revenue. Only three companies signed on to the brief life of Game Factory, Sega, Acclaim, and Virgin Interactive. You could also rent game consoles like the N64 and PlayStation. Game Factory did end up returning as Game Rush in 2003 and was supposed to be a direct competitor to GameStop. Probably the most ambitious expansion for Blockbuster would be the proposition of opening a sports complex slash amusement park in Southern Florida. Now let's pump the brakes here for a moment and explore this in more detail as you're probably like me when I first read about this and you can't believe what you just heard. In 1994, Huizinga convinced the state of Florida and county officials to build a 2,500-acre sports complex northwest of Miami in Dade and Broward counties. The Blockbuster Park would be a dual sports complex and theme park. Wayne's World, the unofficial name given to the Blockbuster Park by local residents, a play on Huizinga's first name and the popular movie would in essence become Florida's 68th county with the ability to impose tax levies among other powers granted to small governments. Highlights from the park included a 45,000 seat baseball stadium next to a 20,000 seat hockey stadium, an amusement park with rides, music, TV and movie recording studios, a 15 to 20 screen movie theater, rides and corporate offices. All the planning and money spent on initial development went to waste when Viacom scrapped Blockbuster Park the following year when it bought Blockbuster. Blockbuster did manage to save some of its work when it salvaged Blockbuster Golf and Games in 1995. The 26-acre entertainment complex had batting cages, laser tag, a three-story arcade, and bumper cars. It lasted until March 2000, and the location is now an IKEA furniture store. Undeterred, Blockbuster also tried several downscaled entertainment complexes called Blockbuster Block Parties. These entertainment indoor fun lands went to two cities at the end of 1994. An additional two test sites were planned, but I was never able to find out where those were going to be. If you do know where they were, let me know in the comment section below. The Albuquerque, New Mexico location opened December 19, 1994, and the Indianapolis, Indiana Block Party opened in January 95. The entertainment complexes were aimed at adults and contained theme areas, restaurants, games, mazes, laser tag, and rides, all inside an indoor facility the size of a city block. Each center cost around five to eight million dollars to build and were around 25,000 to 40,000 square feet. The year prior, in 1993, Blockbuster invested $10.3 million buying into Discovery Zone, owning 21% of the company, and by 1994, Blockbuster poured another $91 million into DZ to own 50.1% of the company to make it the majority owner. Blockbuster's internal research showed indoor play places and arcades were a hit for all age groups. However, 
This was a huge mistake on the part of Blockbuster, as Discovery Zone would file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in March 96, just two years after it acquired a majority stake in the company. Talk about bad luck for Blockbuster, and it wouldn't be the first time the company's internal research division failed it. Another notable weird addition to this list of crazy adventures of Blockbuster in the 90s were the Blockbuster Entertainment Awards show. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome last year's Blockbuster winner for favorite actress in an action adventure, Halle Berry. It was an annual awards show the company put on from 1995 until 2001. In the first two years of the show, it was taped and later broadcast in June, usually a couple of days after the event took place. The award show was moved to early March to capitalize on the hype surrounding the Oscars and move the show to their own TV network, UPN. Not sure why Blockbuster thought it was a good idea to have an award show. Americans already had the Oscars, the Emmys, the Grammys, the MTV Movie Awards, and the People's Choice Awards. Most of these have been running for at least a couple of decades, with the MTV Movie Awards started three years before. Blockbuster nixed their award show in 2002 due to low viewership and heightened security costs needed in a post-9-11 world. Why wait for what's coming to you? Blockbuster Visa from Nations Bank. Who think a Visa card could be this entertaining? Movie rental from Blockbuster Video when you rent another. Hot Domino's Pizza, a hot movie from Blockbuster Video. If you can't take the heat. For a large twisted crust pizza and you get a coupon for a free movie rental at Blockbuster. Pizza, breadsticks, new releases at Blockbuster. Hurry and get a coupon for a two-for-one Blockbuster video rental when you buy food and a medium drink at Taco Bell. As you can tell, there was a lot going on at Blockbuster Corporate. Huizinga sold Blockbuster to Viacom in 1994 for $8.4 billion after he was unable to come up with a solution to propel the traditional video rental store model into the 21st century. In 1996, Blockbuster also started to slowly close some of its music stores due to a slump in music sales. Some Blockbuster video stores ended up converting some space to sell music and PC software. Yes, you heard that right. Blockbuster tried to get into the business of selling computer software at its stores for a short period of time. Blockbuster stock had been steadily dropping in the months prior to the merger. It saw a small rise once the deal was announced, but by 1997, Blockbuster was only worth $4.6 billion, a loss of $3.8 billion for Viacom in just three years. Viacom was in a bidding war with the QVC network over Paramount Pictures and it was betting that Blockbuster would bring in the cash it needed in order to help finance the deal. Huizinga would step down as CEO, with Taco Bell CEO John Antiaco filling the position. Remember earlier we talked about Blockbuster expanding overseas in the UK in the early 90s? Well, it also expanded to our English-speaking brethren in Australia. While Blockbuster had already been around in the States for 10 years in 1995, it had just reached Australia at this point. The last Blockbuster in Australia closed in March 2019, and the former Blockbuster managers John and Lynn let us know how Blockbuster started off down under. Okay, yeah, 1995. They came in and um, were basically corporate. They uh, came in and um, bought out a number of existing video stores in Australia, opened up a couple of new ones, but mainly bought out. That's the Blockbuster promise. Blockbuster, bringing entertainment home. And uh, after about five years, they decided that um, they couldn't continue on the way they were. It was too slow a progress. So they then bought out, not bought out, but converted a number of chains. At that stage, we were with a company called Movieland. Uh, we had stores in Victoria, South Australia, and Western Australia. Uh, probably around about 100 stores across those three states. Um, we can all convert it over to Blockbuster, and they bought out or converted stores in Queensland and New South Wales. All of a sudden, they're up to about 300 stores, and that's where we entered the uh, Blockbuster family. Diversifying into amusement parks and expanding overseas in large chunks may have seemed questionable decisions since Blockbuster was already being warned that the traditional movie rental business model was going to go away. 
One of those people Blockbuster screwed was Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix. Hastings had taken a bit too long to return his copy of Apollo 13 in 1997 and incurred a $40 late fee. Infuriated, he created Netflix one year later and destroyed Blockbuster. A true underdog story. Except that isn't true. It's a convenient fan fiction that has taken over the internet lore and a story that Hastings has perpetuated on several occasions. The story of how Reed Hastings and Mark Randolph started Netflix has changed several times over the years. In 1997, Hastings and Randolph wanted to create the Amazon of something and settled on renting out DVDs. A year after it was founded, Netflix wasn't doing too hot, so they approached Hollywood Video and Blockbuster about selling themselves to them. While Hollywood Video showed some interest, Blockbuster flat out turned them down, citing that VCRs were still selling at 13 million units a year and zeroing in on Netflix's losses of $11.1 million its first year. They, they saw, they, their boys thought they had millions in the bank account, they had lots, and Netflix had nothing. They had no money in their account, they had nothing. They were be, dealing with a zero trading account, and whereas Blockbuster was dealing with all those millions, and they had millions sitting in there. Blockbuster passing up the opportunity to buy Netflix this first time around isn't the only thing they screwed up as the 90s were coming to a close. According to Slate.com, Warren Lieberfarb, who then headed the home video division of Warner Brothers, offered Blockbuster CEO John Antiaco a deal that would have made the DVD the same kind of rental business like VHS was. During the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, movie rental companies would buy large amounts of VHS tapes, often a full price of $40 to $80 per tape. Movie rental companies would rent them out to customers for a few dollars at a time, requiring them to rent these copies out a couple of dozen times to turn a profit on the initial purchase. Movie studios would release the movies to the general public later down the road. Warner Brothers proposed that this video rental business model be extended to DVDs. Blockbuster and other chains would still get an exclusivity window to rent out first before movies would go on sale, just like VHS. In return, the studios would still receive 40% of the rental revenues and Blockbuster pocketing the other 60%. It only seemed natural and logical that the business model used for VHS would transfer over to DVD. But this is where Blockbuster made a crucial mistake. For whatever reason, Blockbuster said no. It turned down Warner Brothers' offer. I guess they tried to renegotiate more profit? During this time, Blockbuster had a lot of clout with movie studios. By itself, Blockbuster accounted for half of all rental revenue in the United States. Maybe it was because they didn't realize DVD technology would catch on so quickly, but in my opinion, this one decision is the real reason why Blockbuster started its eventual demise and they couldn't have screwed it up at a more important time in entertainment history. All subsequent bad decisions in Blockbuster's future can be traced back to this moment in time in my opinion. The digital video disc player is one of the best-selling home entertainment technologies ever. It's probably only eclipsed by the TV itself because of the time TV started selling. In the first six months of 1997, 400,000 DVD players were sold in the US. It took the VHS format two years to sell that many. The prices of DVD players were also falling rapidly. In April 98, they were selling on average for $1,100. Just one year later, you could get one on average for under $600, and by the end of 1999, they would be around 200 bucks. By January 99, there were 1.1 million DVD players sold in the US, with 4 million more expected to be sold by the industry analysts by year's end. Why in the world Blockbuster didn't take something like this into account is beyond me. By December 2000, there would be 13 million DVD players sold in the United States. In response to Blockbuster biting the hand that fed it, Lieberfarb still needed to make money for his company and offered to sell movies right out of the gate to wholesale companies like Walmart. This put movie rental companies in direct competition with wholesale stores starting on day one instead of having the advantage of renting to the public first. Walmart went on to replace Blockbuster as studio's number one source of revenue for home entertainment. P. 
people were now choosing to buy movies versus renting them. This was catastrophic for Blockbuster. In some cases, a few stores like Best Buy would even price newly released movies on DVD below their own wholesale price to draw in customers who might buy products with higher profit margins such as plasma TVs or DVD players. This means that companies were willing to sell movies at a loss in order to get foot traffic in their stores. Blockbuster didn't have high ticket items to sell and became a casualty in the cutthroat business of attracting customers. Not able to match the low prices of Walmart, Target, or Best Buy, Blockbuster's rental business was decimated. Seeing DVD as a threat now, Blockbuster and Hollywood Video refused to stock DVDs in their stores for a little while, making Netflix the only nationwide place to rent a DVD from. Reeling from its mistake with movie studios, Blockbuster commenced damage control. It created the Blockbuster Rewards Program, which rewarded customers with one free rental after having rented six movies. The testing for this occurred in November 98 and was so successful, the rewards program was expanded nationwide in the spring of 99. Show us your cards, America! Millions of Americans show us their cards every week, and we show them a lot. Wow, what a difference! Blockbuster Video, wow! At its peak, the rewards program had enrolled 65 million people with around 20 million active users. To put this into perspective at how large and successful the program was, the 2000 U.S. Census stated there were 281.4 million Americans. Now take a look at this census chart from that year. Let's count the number of prime age movie renters. Not everyone in the 15 to 19 category can rent, but including that figure should even out not counting the numbers in the 45 to 54 age category who do rent. Adding these age groups together, there were over 161 million people. Blockbuster had 65 million users in the rewards program and 20 million of those using the program on a regular basis. Blockbuster had 40% of the country enrolled in the program with 12.4% of the nation as prime renters coming to their store on a regular basis. It is astounding that so many people were willing to go to a store that doesn't offer anything they need like groceries or toothpaste. This is also the year Blockbusters began to include popcorn and other amenities at the checkout line to help increase revenue. In that same year, Blockbuster began to siphon itself off from Viacom as it had never really fit into the overall vision Viacom had for it. Blockbuster also became a publicly traded company and became listed as BBI on the New York Stock Exchange in 99. In 2000, Blockbuster and Enron, yes, that Enron, entered into an agreement to disseminate Hollywood movies on demand through Enron's new internet transmission line it was laying throughout the US. Blockbuster had a plan to bypass DVDs altogether and allow you to watch movies from home through high-speed internet called Digital Subscriber Line, or DSL for short. Blockbuster had the content and Enron would supply the physical infrastructure to get movies into people's living rooms. Sounds a lot like what we've got today, right? The partnership was supposed to last 20 years, but both parties pulled out after eight months and Enron cited concerns that it believed Blockbuster wasn't committed to the joint venture like it should have been. The reality is probably that Enron didn't have the infrastructure like it said it did, and of course, we all know how that company ended up. If both companies had committed to this relationship like they were supposed to, they might have killed Netflix for good. I'm not sure why Blockbuster didn't try to do the video on demand service with a different company though. Also in 2000, Netflix offered to sell itself to Blockbuster for the second time. They pitched the idea to Blockbuster executives who agreed to another meeting. Netflix founders Reed Hastings and Mark Randolph flew to Dallas, Texas to pitch the idea to Blockbuster leadership. They proposed that Netflix would run Blockbuster's online activities while Blockbuster would promote Netflix in its stores. Hastings' idea surmised that Netflix would spare Blockbuster much of the initial cost of converting older catalog titles to DVD and could also concentrate on niche films, both things Netflix was already known for. Netflix, in return, would get access to Blockbuster's customers and even agree to pay a fee for this privilege. Blockbuster could then concentrate on new releases, which made up around 80% of movie rentals at the time and could begin to split new titles between DVDs and VHS. The idea included Blockbuster placing a kiosk in its stores to encourage signups to Netflix. The proposition would have been a win-win for both companies and customers.
but it was not to be. The two Netflix executives were practically laughed out of the room. Even though Netflix had been around a few years now, it still wasn't very profitable, and Blockbuster board members only zeroed in on the fact that Netflix was close to losing over $55 million that year. Blockbuster did not take into account the emergent internet market and its potential. I've been in the industry for a long time. I didn't believe that we would have had the effect that Netflix had on us in such a very, very short time. Not only did they turn down Netflix a second time, they also messed up the opportunity to get into the video on demand business early on. Now, while I've painted a lot of gloom and doom for Blockbuster over the last few minutes, there were actually a lot of positives for the company. Blockbuster's marketing machine was incredible. Outside of their stores, you could find the blue and yellow torn ticket on kids' cereals, baking soda, Visa credit cards, Ziploc bags, dry clean wrappings, and sponsored a college football tournament called the Blockbuster Bowl. Blockbuster would also go on to sponsor Josh Wise in the Daytona 500 in February 2013. Uh, customer perspective was concerned. Blockbuster would have been number one, mainly due to the brand. Um, uh, that, that torn ticket really made a big difference. And because it was known worldwide, I suppose, and yeah. it's been in movies. And, and, and I mean, when we converted from Movie Land to Blockbuster, um, we didn't realize what a effect that the torn ticket had with us. The, the business just boomed. It was, it, it was beyond our expectations. And obviously with uh, Blockbuster, we had the advantage of their marketing power. Um, I don't know if you recall Carl and Ray, they were the, uh, what was it, chipmunk and whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, we ran those ads over here and the, the success was incredible. We, we had Carl and Ray stuffed dolls and, you know, we, we couldn't keep them on the shelf. They were selling so quickly. In the early 2000s, Blockbuster expanded like crazy. At its peak in November 2004, the company had 9,094 stores worldwide. On its 2004 SEC filing, Blockbuster stated the killing it was making. Our total revenues and gross profit for 2004 were $6.1 billion and $3.6 billion respectively. Of our revenues, 69.5% were generated in the United States and 30.5% were generated outside of the US. Let's break down just how big of a juggernaut Blockbuster really was at the end of 2004. There were 5,803 stores in the United States and its territories and 3,291 international stores. Of those 9,094 stores, 7,265 were corporate owned and the other 1,829 were franchised. And those were just the Blockbuster video stores. The company still operated stores that specialized in the gaming market. Blockbuster operated 178 Game Station stores in the UK, 5 Game Rush stores in Australia, and 5 video game vending machines in Spain. Just to give you an idea of how big they had expanded outside of the US, and besides videos, on December 31st, 2004, Blockbuster employed 84,300 people with 58,500 in the US and the other 25,800 outside of the country. 1,400 of these were seasonal workers. The company's distribution centers were open 24 hours a day, six days a week. Blockbuster was basically the British empire of business. It seemed like the sun never set on the Blockbuster empire. But like the British empire, Blockbuster would reach a peak and then begin a journey of a precipitous decline. In 2002, Blockbuster purchased DVD Rental Central for $1 million. It was an Arizona father and son online DVD rental company with 10,000 subscribers. This purchase would lay down the infrastructure and would become Blockbuster Online, a separate arm of the company in August 2004 and be a direct response to Netflix. Blockbuster's DVD by mail service was neglected by corporate and the franchise owners threatened to sue Blockbuster Online. Corporate management offered little help besides money, 
not even allowing the Blockbuster Online team the ability to use the addresses of Blockbuster's customers in inventory and instead required them to find their own customers and build their own inventory. The online group had to negotiate their own deals with movie companies for movies to rent out. To get word out, Blockbuster Online attempted to team up with Yahoo, Amazon, or AOL, but were thwarted by Blockbuster's legal team. To try and get a leg up, Blockbuster Online management sent family and friends on spy missions disguised as confused Netflix customers who were trying to return movies to Netflix distribution centers. Netflix eventually caught on and put a stop to this. Blockbuster Online was actually better than Netflix in 2004. Like Netflix, you could choose movies to rent and have them delivered to you by mail. But what made Blockbuster Online better was the massive selection it had because of the money they had spent on licensing and inventory. Blockbuster Online leveraged its name recognition with movie studios and built up a far vaster library of movies than Netflix had. Even better was that Blockbuster Online was cheaper at $20 a month versus the $22 a month Netflix had raised its prices to. The best part though was that Blockbuster Online had the newest titles first while you still had to wait a few weeks for Netflix to get them. Now if you recall, John Antiaco is Blockbuster CEO at this time and he had built up a lot of goodwill over the nine years he was in charge of the company. Before being CEO of Blockbuster, he had had several COO and CEO positions such as being CEO of PepsiCo. Under his tenure, Blockbuster hit its zenith. He had changed the image of Blockbuster a great deal. He turned Blockbusters back into clean stores with improved lighting, changed the customer service mentality, decreased wait times to rent a movie, improved store selections, decreased product prices for customers, and best of all, he got rid of late fees. My man was like, no more late fees? That means you never have to return your movies. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, dude, I don't think you get the concept of rent. It's not a gift. Renting is better than ever at the new Blockbuster. And with even more copies, these hot DVDs are guaranteed to be there. See participating stores for complete details. Of course, with all these positive changes, revenue improved, and naturally, Antiaco had a lot of pull. Looking to propel Blockbuster into the future, Antiaco wanted Blockbuster to stomp out all the competition. So what did he do? He made Blockbuster Online even better. Antiaco ended up lowering the price of Blockbuster Online to $15 a month. A mistake that would come back to bite the company down the road as the price of the program wasn't enough to cover cost. However, consumers did take note of the substantially cheaper price over Netflix. After running an ad during the Super Bowl in 2005, subscriptions to Blockbuster Online went through the roof. The DVD by mail service for Blockbuster was a smash hit. The combination of an established customer base, physical brick and mortar stores, video game rentals from multiple game systems, a subscription movie and game rental service that rivaled the competition, and a massive presence in the market, all but guaranteed Blockbuster was going to annihilate Netflix. Even with the success, Antiaco wasn't going to slow down. He was here to win. Blockbuster Online would be changed to Blockbuster Total Access, which would incorporate the use of the physical Blockbuster stores. The change allowed subscribers to get three movies mailed to you and then trade those three in the stores for movies. When you did this, your next three movies in your online queue would be mailed to you. Blockbuster Total Access Netflix. Essentially, they work the same way. You order movies online, they come right to your mailbox, you watch them, then mail them back in a prepaid envelope. But what if you're thinking, let's get a new movie right away? With Netflix, you mail them back and wait. But only Blockbuster gives you the option of bringing them back to the store and exchanging them. No extra charge. Here's your new movie, sir. So you never have to wait. That was fast. Movies through the mail, plus movies through the store, one low price. That's Blockbuster Total Access. By doing this, you could have up to six movies from Blockbuster at any given time. Blockbuster was beating Netflix at its own game. It was an incredible deal for the price, and I remember being a subscriber to it when I was in high school. But success comes at a cost, and several Blockbuster board members weren't happy with how much money the changes were costing the company. Canceling the late fee policy was costing Blockbuster $200 million a year in lost revenue, and Antiaco had invested another $200 million into the Total Access program. In addition to this, most franchise locations would not honor the trade-in portion of the Blockbuster Total Access program, sometimes forcing program members to find a corporate-owned location. Now, to be fair, 
Remember that most blockbusters were corporate owned, so in most cases, it wasn't a far drive. Worse, the elimination of late fees meant people didn't have the motivation to return movies in a timely manner. Because of this, blockbusters sometimes didn't have inventory to rent out. With such large sums of cash being spent on unproven methods and franchise owners unhappy, some leadership within Blockbuster weren't pleased with the direction Antiaco was taking the company. Antiaco had eroded much of the goodwill he had built up over the years when he invested so much money, manpower, and time into the online segment of Blockbuster. Enter Carl Eichmann, a man who was vocal about his displeasure with how Antiaco was steering the company. Eichmann wanted Antiaco to leave, but he knew it would cost too much money in separation fees, so he put up with Antiaco. However, Antiaco and Eichmann and other board members went to blows in 2008, and Antiaco left the company. He didn't feel like Blockbuster would go down a bad path because he believed the company would naturally put his right-hand man in to replace him. But this was not the case, and Blockbuster brought in former 7-Eleven CEO Jim Keyes. In their infinite wisdom, Blockbuster raised the prices of total access and stopped letting customers exchange movies in their stores. No surprise, the incredible growth Blockbuster was seeing in total access ground to a halt. Instead, Keys had Blockbuster Inc. a deal with streaming service MovieLink in September 2008. Blockbuster would now sell set-top boxes for home viewing, an option that was not attractive for consumers at the time. People didn't want another box to hook up. They already had a cable box, internet modem, Wi-Fi router, maybe a game console, a DVD player, and a VCR. It's hard to imagine that leadership couldn't see internet as the future, or that they would be eroding the goodwill with their customers by allowing the swapping of DVDs at their stores. This is where Netflix shine. You could watch as many movies as you wanted on your time, all with a subscription-based model that had no late fees and only a flat monthly rate. Netflix experimented with several subscription plans for customers before settling on the tiered monthly subscription service that we're familiar with today. The Netflix approach eliminated almost all of the friction consumers felt. The only thing Blockbuster locations had going for them was the years of prestige and the ability to deliver instant satisfaction. Another thing Netflix was beating Blockbuster at was its customer service and market analysis research. Blockbuster employees often gave the impression they didn't care about your business because they were the king of rental. Netflix's software was also designed to automatically gather data from its customers from the get-go, something we still benefit from today. They had their parameters that they had to try to get to, but you can't keep doing, you know, being the good old boys in the room, keep doing the same things over and over again. You really needed to have a little bit of vision and, and look outside the box. And, you know, there are people like Jim Keyes. I mean, he came in at the end and, and really tried to do some great things for the store. But I feel like by the time they kind of caught on, it was too late. Getting out of the box, if you will. So it's not just about being your favorite corner video store. Today, it's about making our content available anywhere, anytime. So we have new, brand new Blockbuster Express kiosks coming here to New York City for right. a new level of convenience. We have uh, uh, DVDs by mail, uh, similar to the way Netflix provides their service. And then uh, also, more recently, Blockbuster On Demand, with Blockbuster Movies as convenient as a button on your remote control. In 2009, Blockbuster and Samsung signed an agreement to stream movies together with a new service called Blockbuster On Demand, a la carte service where you paid a rental fee per viewing for a time period. Samsung would install a Blockbuster app on its devices to allow customers to stream on demand. In return, Blockbuster would sell some Samsung electronics in its stores. Blockbuster also had a similar deal with TiVo. TiVo would give its customers the ability to watch movies through Blockbuster On Demand as well, and in return, Blockbuster would display TiVo products in its stores. However, at this point, these deals were just playing catch up with the rest of the industry. Not only was Netflix a thing, but Amazon already offered customers the ability to stream a digitally rented movie. Amazon had also recently rolled out its Prime program. The ability to buy almost anything from Amazon's vast array of products with two-day shipping and an included video service that included some free movies as well as rentals made Blockbuster On Demand look pretty lame. Shifting focus from DVD by mail to gain immediate satisfaction, Blockbuster began competing with Redbox outside of stores. 
In 2010, they teamed up with NRC to create Blockbuster Express video kiosk and Blockbuster Digital Express kiosk. The digital kiosks were an extremely stupid idea. These interfaces had customers hook up thumb drives into a kiosk and you could take home a digital copy of a movie. Once viewing began, the movie was only good for 48 hours before deleting itself. There were about six locations in Los Angeles that had them, but the idea never took off. Why on earth Blockbuster executives thought that people would travel to a location just to download a movie instead of downloading content at home would work is beyond me. The regular Blockbuster Express kiosk was still not enough to save the company, and all 10,000 kiosks and all associated inventory were sold to Redbox in 2012. After missing a payment to bondholders on August 13, 2010, the company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy August 26. The company was $900 million in debt. During the bankruptcy filing, Blockbuster would keep its doors open, but would begin to slowly close them as time went on. The previous sprawling network of 4,500 locations, once a staple of its business, were now a liability. Dish Network would buy Blockbuster and would negotiate to keep around 600 of the most profitable Blockbuster locations open. Thousands of Blockbuster locations had offered customers the ability to return movies with ease and had offered Blockbuster the ability to shelf inventory from store to store as needed. However, franchise owners were now having to ask landlords to renegotiate rents. In 2011, Blockbuster and Dish Network would launch a new service called Blockbuster Movie Pass and it would again be a direct competitor to Netflix. You could stream and have movies and games mailed to you, all for just $10 a month. But extreme logic would be used again by leadership and the subscription service was only available to subscribers who had Dish Network's pay for TV service. Blockbuster Movie Pass died a quiet, unnoticed death one year later. In January 2012, it was announced that Dish would be closing some of its less profitable Blockbuster stores. Two years later, in January 2014, Blockbuster only had 400 corporate-owned stores left in the U.S. and it announced it would close all these locations and would stop the DVD by mail program. The very last movie to ever be rented from a corporate-owned Blockbuster was This Is The End at a Blockbuster in Hawaii on November 9th, 2013. Blockbuster's Twitter page retweeted a picture from the final rental with Seth Rogen retweeting and commenting on the tragedy of the iconic company going away. Blockbuster's demise continued into 2014 as the last update to Blockbuster.com happened. Blockbuster's social media sites haven't been updated since then either, but you can still visit them if you want to so you can feel some immense sadness at the last days of the company. In December of 2014, there were still 51 franchise Blockbuster stores still open though, mostly in remote locations where internet speeds weren't the best. But Blockbuster's death wasn't complete just yet. In 2015, you could still see the Blockbuster logo on Dish Network devices and menus. They would quietly be replaced by Dish's own video streaming service called Dish Movie Package. Of the 51 locations still open in the US in December 2014, all but one have closed. One by one, they all shut their doors due to the rise and ease of subscription services and faster internet technology spreading. To be fair, a lot of physical retailers have been struggling the last 10 years, with only a few rising from the ashes in the digital era. Areas that had no or slow internet had Blockbuster the longest, with Blockbusters in Alaska being some of the last holdouts in the US. International Blockbusters were also slowly shutting down next to their US counterparts. Blockbuster closed its doors in Peru in 2007, the UK in 2013, Mexico in 2016, and the last Blockbuster in Australia closed March 2019. Netflix officially entered the Australian market in 2015. It was like somebody turned off the tap and we just uh, couldn't compete anymore. We've been in the business for 30 years. We didn't expect this at all. In January 2020, the last international blockbuster closed in Dragaville, New Zealand. The shining blue lights of DVD chains like Blockbuster Video are now almost non-existent, except for just two in the world, one of them in Dragaville. Uh, Facebook, putting as much ads out as I possibly could, but wasn't sort of getting enough home, enough people to come in the doors to actually warrant it, but I was fighting hard against those services which were available. Once people started seeing the, the faster service come available, 
and where they were getting able to get movies from just as quick as me, but for a cheaper price, EG free. At the time of this video, there is just one blockbuster left in the entire world, and it's in Bend, Oregon. It's actually doing quite well. Store manager Sandy Harding attributes the success of the store to the popularity of nostalgia. We haven't changed a thing. Our prices are still the same. Our store is still the same. We have, you know, yellow Formica countertops. We have popcorn ceiling. We have blue and gold everything. We have the 1992 floppy disk computers. I mean, everything. So wow, really? we are very throwback nostalgia. Yeah, they are DOS based. They're the ones I used in high school. So they're awesome. I know how to use them because they were only here for the weekend, but they wanted to come and rent a movie just to have that experience while they were here. So all of those things help support the store. We have people who, you know, send me, I got a box of VHS tapes yesterday from someone across the country who sent them here to donate them to help support the store. So, um, and no, I don't rent VHS anymore, but we sell them and we do other stuff that's all just kind of great. So yes, the business models changed some, but there's still a lot of the traditional stuff. I love it. I love meeting people and talking to them and just experiencing this whole nostalgic with everyone that it's just amazing. This isn't the only place Blockbuster continues to live on though. Surprisingly, you can still get the Blockbuster movie streaming service in four Nordic countries. Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden all offer Blockbuster On Demand. Blockbuster Online has done quite well in the Nordic countries, with it now being the number one streaming service in Denmark. Three of the four, Denmark, Finland, and Sweden, actively post on their respective Instagram pages. And in January 2020, Sling TV began quietly rolling out Blockbuster movie nights. A pre-selected movie is available to watch through Sling for free every Friday for now. Here are some quotes from Dish and Sling on the future of Blockbuster under them. We can all take solace in the fact that Blockbuster still lives on in Oregon and in the far off places of Northern Europe, and that maybe, just maybe, it might make a comeback one day in some other form. Do you have any fond memories of Blockbuster? Or did you hate them? Share your experiences with Blockbuster in the comment section below and be sure to subscribe on your way out. This is Movie University, education in cinema.